Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hello and welcome to the new Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit and I'm here with Patrick Barron, the founder of Validator Capital. And Validator Capital does a lot of things. So thank you for making the time, Patrick, to come talk to us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Monica. So can you tell me a little bit about this? What is Validator Capital, first of all? What is the mission of this thing? It sounds like a fund. Is it a fund? Mm -hmm. Yes. Validator Capital is a fund. It's a digital asset fund, and it's focused specifically on the Celo ecosystem. Uh, so we support really at an infrastructure layer uh, the, the Celo network. We provide, uh, we run a validator group, which means that we participate in the consensus mechanism. We run validator nodes. We also contribute to the stability of the stable coins on the protocol. Uh, so we run a trading algorithm that uh, contributes to that stability and, uh, and also earns a profit for our LPs. That's awesome. So um, give me a sense of this. You're, you're a fund, so you take in fiat US dollars and then you convert them to cello dollars or you convert them into infrastructure that can support cello. But I don't yeah. hear a lot about a lot of funds that only uh, really focus on one project. That's really interesting. Is it that you have invested in that project and so now you're kind of hands-on? A lot of investors sort of want to get into the nuts and bolts of things, be a COO or maybe a community member. Or is it just that you were like, oh, I'm just, I want to be able to, you know, see this thing flourish and you just love it. Is Cello kind of your project as well or no? So no, Cello is not really my project alone. There's an entire community uh, around Cello. And you know, the reason why I decided to focus in on this is that uh, you can either make a, a, a little bit of money a lot of times, or you can make a lot of money a little bit of time. And uh, so my thesis is that we're gonna see a power law distribution in terms of value accrual within the crypto ecosystem as a whole. And uh, I don't think that the- Wait a second, you're gonna see uh, a shift in the value accrual ecosystem? What do you mean by that? What I mean is that the, the Pareto principle is in effect in the crypto economy, just like it is in every other part of nature. And so we will see a small handful of projects accumulate the vast majority of the users and the vast majority of the value. And uh, I don't believe that uh, the current setup in terms of the ranking of uh, uh, the, the coins that we have now is how it's going to be 10 years from now. I think that there will be shifting. And I think that uh, ultimately uh, what's missing is a, is a global payments platform, a platform that can reach every single mobile phone in the world. And uh, I've been in the crypto space long enough to see many different attempts and approaches at, uh, at achieving that, at the, achieving the goal of reaching the unbanked. And this is the first project that I've seen that I believe at a very deep level uh, can do that. It can reach a billion users. Uh, it can bring a billion new users into the global financial economy uh, and provide a, a very high level of value. So. My thesis is that uh, this project in particular is special. And uh, so that's why I wanted to focus my time and our LP's capital in providing uh, as much value to that ecosystem as we can. Uh, and so that's the reason why we decided to, to focus in here. Uh, and I also feel like there's a, a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in, in this in that uh, it's not just putting money to work and then, you know, praying that it, that it, uh, that it goes up. It's uh, being involved in the community on a daily basis, helping to make the decisions, to bring good people in, uh, to spread the word. And uh, ultimately, you know, we can achieve the goals that we set out uh, because uh, we are active 
in this community and, and filling in the gaps where we see things that need to be filled in. And uh, so it's a, uh, it's a very active strategy is what I would say. Uh, it's also, you know, it's also work, working out quite well so far. That's fantastic. So tell me yeah. a little bit about how you kind of, how did you even come across Cello and, and what were your, you know, what, I know you were in traditional banking for a while, but how did that, you know, transition happen and, and you know, how'd you leap and end up landing on Cello? That's an interesting kind of backstory there. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, at the, at the time I, when I left, uh, when I left the bank and I was working at a global retail bank, which is where I got very familiar with how the payments infrastructure works, how, uh, you know, what people depend on and what people expect from that type of relationship. Uh, and I also came away quite um, uh, with a feeling that uh, we could do better, uh, that there, that it's possible to have a better system than the systems that exist. And, uh, you know, I was also, I was working in the renewable energy industry at the time, which is a very capital intensive industry and, uh, and does quite a bit of good in the world, but uh, has, it doesn't have the potential to scale in the same way that a software business does uh, yeah, in terms of being lean. And so uh, when I heard about Bitcoin, uh, I was immediately intrigued. Uh, what do you mean that you can make peer to peer payments? What do you mean that it doesn't go through a centralized third party? Uh, well, what do you mean, mean that you heard about Bitcoin? When was that? Like back in, you know, <laughs> how long so ago I heard did about, you actually heard about it? And how, yeah, what so was I, the context of which you heard about Bitcoin? That might be a little different than most. So this was back in 2013 and uh, one of the other salespeople was bragging about how they were able to buy some drugs online. And <laughs> while I don't condone that behavior, I, I certainly was curious as to, uh, as to how that was possible. Uh, because again, I, I understood how compliance works and I understood how legacy systems work. And so uh, there's just so how basic laws layer. that could like, you know, how class A drugs get, uh, get work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So, you know, so uh, that was really the, the trigger that, uh, that tripped me down the, the slippery rabbit hole. And, uh, and then what I realized is that there's just layer upon layer of interesting complexity because this, uh, this technological system it incorporates um, monetary policy, it incorporates uh, uh, cryptography, it incorporates economics, it incorporates a, a lot of different disciplines and uh, brings them together to create uh, this new, you know, what, what I'll call a technology platform, this new social technology. And, yeah. uh, and I realized that, uh, okay, like there's, this is going to change the world. This is going to change the way that people interact with each other and the way that people communicate with each other because ultimately yeah. ultimately money is a language it's the language by which we communicate Ooh. value i love that ultimately money is a language that's a tweetable that's really cool we should remember that one ultimately money is a language i like that yeah i i can't claim that when i, I lifted that from andrea santinopoulos but uh it there's there's a fundamental truth to it uh, and so you know money has always been a social technology it's been a technology that that serves us and uh, simply what, what we've done is that we've upgraded that technology and now it's more accessible, now it's faster, now it's more open, now it's borderless, now it's permissionless. Uh, so when I, when I came to understand these things and to really what the potential was, I decided that I was going to, I was going to build, uh, I was going to build a business, I was going to build a career, I was going to contribute to this because it's so early, I felt like I could make a contribution to the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, started, started in the industry. Uh, we built out a, a, an Ethereum powered derivatives trading platform. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. That, that sounds a little bit insane. So can you tell me, how, first of all, um, what, what is that in English? And secondly, um, how did you come to even want to make a derivatives trading platform in Ethereum? Yeah, so uh, the product was, uh, we essentially created two fiat backed stable coins, a USD backed stable coin, which, it, which ba at a basic level, what it means is that uh, you put a dollar into a custodial account and then you get a token that represents $1. It's a bearer instrument and you can redeem that token for that underlying asset, in this case, a dollar uh, or as well a euro. And, uh, and so we created a two fiat backed stable coins, dollars and euros. Uh, we 
plugged in uh, to interactive brokers to get uh, real-time price feeds. That was our Oracle. And uh, uh, traders could deposit margin into a smart contract. And so the smart contract becomes the escrow uh, that would hold the assets. Uh, nice. And then, uh, and they could set the time, they could set, uh, you know, the expiration dates. And uh, as prices fluctuate between those, uh, between the currency pairs, they could uh, essentially at the end, the margin would, it would go back and forth and then it would settle out depending on uh, how the price had moved during, during that period. Um, I partnered with a, uh, an instructor who was teaching at, uh, at Blockchain University at the time. I was taking classes there to better understand it and just felt like it was interesting. Uh, it was, this was 2015, right after Ethereum launched. And, you know, I thought, hey, we can sell this. We, yeah. can, we, can, get, we can get the banks. I was wrong. We couldn't sell it. Uh, we did not find product market fit. Uh, <laughs> it was way too early. And, you know, I, I certainly didn't, uh, I didn't have the vision to just launch the, uh, the fiat backed stable coin as a standalone product, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it led to, it led to other things. It, uh, it led me to where I am now ultimately. Uh, so, you know, you, you had asked how I got into cello and I, I yeah, how did you find on them? a tangent just, and didn't like, quite, looking uh, around. <laughs> tangents are good. Tangents are totally good. You should tangent away. But, you know, in this winding long path, you know, you're like, I was, I was hiking through the mountains of Central America and I discovered this cello <laughs> sword yeah, in the so, stone. <laughs> uh, you know, I had, uh, I, I read the white paper when it, when it came out and, uh, and thought it was quite interesting, but I uh, didn't really circle back to it until, you know, at least a, a year later. Um, and uh, at this time, uh, I was uh, working on a project, uh, and we were attempting to build something very similar. We were attempting to build a payments uh, platform where you could text payments. And uh, we had a mechanism where you could text an encrypted payment link uh, to any phone. You, uh, you could text either Bitcoin or you could text Ether. And, uh, and the, the recipient could uh, click the link. It would establish a wallet if they didn't have one and then deposit the funds. Uh, and it's so cool. yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It was also I clunky that right now, you know. Like <laughs> I owe money to my developer in Czech Republic, and I could use that right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the great thing is, is that uh, it uh, it removes one of the hurdles, which is that typically you have to download a wallet, and then you have to send uh, the sender your public key, so they know where to send the money to. Uh, yeah. and, it, and so it removes that hurdles. Uh, but ultimately, there's just all sorts of user experience problems associated with uh, with that mechanism. And uh, but at the time, I was reaching out to stablecoin companies to build partnerships, and uh, yeah. and I reached out to Cello, and uh, uh, and then quickly realized after spending some time with them that uh, they that the approach that they were taking just had overcome all the hurdles that uh, we were facing and what I knew that we were going to face. Uh, what, were those, so, what were the biggest hurdles? Like when you, what was the hurdle that you saw that made you go, oh my God, I don't have to build this anymore. They did it. This is amazing. Yeah. So, so one of the hurdles is like just being able to access uh, the blockchain and be able to verify a transaction on your phone. If you're using, you know, if you're, if you're sending a transaction on Ethereum, for example, and you want to uh, verify a transaction for yourself on your phone, you're, you're probably one not going to have enough storage space on your phone to be able to download an entire copy of the blockchain. Uh, it's going to take several days to sync. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the bigger hurdles is that if you want to send a transaction on a platform, uh, specifically Ethereum, which by the way, I'm not bashing Ethereum. I, I love Ethereum and it's very near and dear to my heart. I'm just uh, explaining what some of the one of the, some of the challenges are to building on it. Uh, you have to hold the native asset Ether in order to send, uh, say, a USD stablecoin, right? right? So people have to have two assets in order to make one transaction. That's a huge, you know, that's that's a problem. People don't get that. That's not uh, that's not how things work in in the traditional uh, payment systems. And so building a building a platform that you know one has an ultra light sync capability, uh, which uh, any feature phone, any uh, primitive smartphone can verify transactions. Uh, second, making it uh, incredibly uh, easy to use such that you can, you can pay transaction fees using the stable coin. You know, these small design changes can have outsized impacts, right? That's Absolutely. like the butterfly effect where uh, a small change can have a, a, an unknown, a consequence of unknown magnitude. 
but uh, you know, ultimately, the the seller team had uh, been thinking about thinking through these problems, and uh, and had had solved them, and uh, and had built quite a, an elegant solution. So it, you know, it does all the beautiful things that uh, Ethereum does, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't have uh, a lot of the baggage, and uh, and can reach any phone in the world. So you can now send dollars to any phone number anywhere in the world, and it clears and settles and less than five seconds and it costs, you know, a thousandth of a penny to send the wow. transaction. So, you know, this is, uh, this is revolutionary stuff. We haven't seen anything like this in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tell people that the first wave of the internet was the internet of communication where it was like, you're not going to believe it, but soon you can send an, an electronic message to anyone in the world. You can communicate with in Kenya for free. And it's like, what the USPS is going to go away? You know, UPS is going to fail? Like, come on, what about a package? And you know, yeah, yeah, that's okay. But the fax machine went away. That's for sure. We don't really need a fax machine at all anymore. Yeah, unless but, you work in government. Right, and then you have to keep it as bureaucratic as possible. Or, yeah. But you know, with the second wave of the internet, it's like it's the internet of of money and in transactions. Yeah. And it's like now the big thing is you can transact with someone in Kenya for basically free. And people are gonna say, you know, what you mean banks are gonna go away and the dollar's gonna go away? Well, no, but Western Union's gonna go away. Right. You know, PayPal had better, you know, good thing they incorporated crypto because they were gonna go away too. They weren't gonna make yeah. it if they didn't incorporate this, you know. So I like it's very away. disruptive, you know. Yeah, the other you know, kind of one of the other large innovations that um, uh, I would say that there was two two big steps that were taken in this uh, in this ecosystem, uh, and uh, one of which is building a stability protocol at the at the core level, at the at the base layer of uh, of the network. You know, so in traditional systems like uh, or in in say the Ethereum ecosystem, for example. We do have uh, uh, examples of stability protocols like MakerDAO, right, uh, which is, issues DAI, and uh, and that you know and that and that is quite innovative. And uh, uh, but it it exists as a, a at a layer on top of the protocol itself. It's not a part of the uh, core Ethereum protocol. And what the what the Celo team decided to do was to include a mechanism to issue stable valued assets at the base layer. So the first one, of course, is cello dollars because that's the most wide, widely used unit of accounts in the world, and it and it will be for the foreseeable future. That's not going anywhere. Uh, but uh, ultimately, what we can do is support an ecology of value. So what uh, what I believe we are going to see is uh, a, a plethora of uh, national fiat currencies that are denominated and uh, and exchanged on this network as well as local regional indexes uh, tied to, say, the price of rice in, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, for example, or, uh, you know, wheat in Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, you, can, you can get a long tail of value and uh, representations of value and send them, again, cheaply, uh, conveniently at, uh, at a very high throughput uh, and and service you know, the local needs of the individual, but also open up the door for them to exchange their value into whatever other store of value or currency they wish to hold. You know, uh, it's so is, interesting. I, I can think about um, my stepfather who I loved dearly and he passed away many years ago, but he told me about his research in East Africa in, about water. And he did it, he and his wife at the time, his first wife, my mother was of course his second wife, but he and his first wife did it in East Africa um, in the 19, I think, 60s. And then they went back, or maybe 50s. They went back, maybe they, even earlier. Anyway, they went back 30 years later and they did the same study again. And when they came back, they found the same little girl was now a woman and she was a matriarch in her community. And what she did for work is that she saved up and bought the only cell phone in the village. Hmm. And she had a stopwatch really? and she would she would, you know, charge people to use the phone mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. minute. And that was her mm -hmm. business. And so I can see how, you know, mobile phones are in the hands of much, many more people now. So that won't necessarily be a case, but it would be interesting to see someone becoming their own little Western union, like, all right, I'll, tr I'll I'm going to, you know, be your OTC desk here while you exactly right. 
Yeah. Well, look, we, you know, that, that model that you just described in terms of uh, uh, individuals becoming tellers and becoming yeah. exchange points, becoming on off ramps. Uh, we've seen that, uh, we've seen that emerge in Kenya with M-Pesa, right? Where you mm -hmm. have, uh, you have local stores that are also brokers where you, uh, where locals can uh, exchange fiat currency for airtime minutes. Uh, but you also have a, a very wide network of sole proprietors that uh, that that's their you know that's their side hustle, and yeah. uh, and there's no reason that that same phenomenon uh, won't emerge uh, all around the world. And so, you know what what I think that we'll see is small to medium sized businesses adding this as a, a service to drive foot traffic, uh, as well as you know gig economy Academy. workers adding another you know another tool to their uh, to their revenue driven tool belt um, yeah i have a question for you about that i don't yeah. know much about your user adoption on the cello network right now but do you have more user adoption in say in parts of africa or in parts of south america or central america i know it sounds like what you've got really is that the best market fit the most immediate market fit and need is addressed um in more emerging economies is that true yeah that's that's definitely true uh Look, I'm in San Francisco, and I don't expect to be able to use cello dollars in my local coffee shop anytime right. soon. And that's because, you know, Apple Pay works very well. Uh, you know, we've got Venmo. Venmo covers the peer-to-peer -peer payments, uh, you know, ecosystem here in the United States, and it, and it works quite well for the purpose that it's designed for. But uh, these types of uh, systems of infrastructure don't exist in every part around the world. And are most uh, of your so, users overseas? Uh, yeah, most of the most of the users are in Latin America, in oh, okay. uh, in Africa, and uh, uh, are Southeast there more, Asia. Are there more in Af like what what region has the most users for you guys right now? I would currently? say, yeah, I would say Latin America. Latin America oh. has the most. Um, you know, and and we've seen like for example in Venezuela uh, over the past you know a uh, couple of years the really just the complete deterioration of value of the of the native currency and yeah. uh the result of that is that there's been essentially dollarization of the venezuelan economy uh yeah. but uh, you know what uh, what we don't have there is a a system of digital payments that's widely used right it's very right. much a a cash-based society uh and uh, you know that's just one of the most extreme examples of value uh, disappearing at, at no faults of the citizens, but because of mismanagement of, uh, of the currency. And uh, so adoption in, in these, uh, in, you know, areas of Latin America, areas of Africa, where uh, the, the leaders have not been good stewards of the value of the currency, we'll say, uh, we're seeing quite high rates of, of adoption. And, uh, and I expect that that's going to pick up. Uh, you know, because now what you do is that if you have a phone, you have uh, essentially a bank in your pocket. Uh, you are the CEO of that bank. And if you, if you don't lose your, uh, the seed phrase, you know, if you memorize your seed phrase, then you now have complete sovereignty over your money. And so, you know, you can choose which, uh, which currency you choose to hold and, and to do business in. Uh, you can access tools like Moolah, which is a, a money market protocol that uh, that, I that is what I want to get to. That's the segue right there. I was I was wondering when we we're going to get to the uh, money market protocol. So first of all, in case any of this is going over anyone's head, what is a protocol in the most basic terms? And then you know what are these? What are the new uh, machinations of a protocol that you come up with? Yeah, I would describe it as a, a language, uh, a kind of a shared set of standards that people use to communicate. So if you're on the same protocol, then you know when you send X command, you're going to get Y result. Uh, so uh, the protocol so it's just a set enables, of agreements. Yeah, it's a set of agreements. It's a set of uh, a way ways of communicating between uh, nodes so that uh, they know how to interpret the message they're receiving and what response to give. Uh, so it's just a, a set of like call and response uh, commands essentially. At a, at a at a high level um and the more agreements that are on a network like cello then the more robust the opportunities to input x and get y or input c and get d right yeah exactly right so you can you can build base layer protocols that uh, uh can do things like the stability protocol and then you can build on top of that right so uh, the money market protocol uses this base layer consensus algorithm 
Uh, it's, uh, it, it relies on the security that's provided by that uh, consensus mechanism, right? So we get certain hard promises uh, around, the, uh, around the security of the network. We also can depend on the stability of the token that's pegged to a dollar. And then from there, we can start building applications on top of that. We can start build. it's like a pyramid, right? At the base layer, you've got the consensus, you've got the stable coin. And then above that, you now can build applications on top of that. And the reason why I decided to uh, build Moola over on Celo is because when I worked for a retail bank, uh, one of the uh, realizations I had is that what people need a bank account for is they need to be able to deposit and withdraw their money, to hold their money, uh, send and receive these basic functionalities. Uh, but they also need to be able to get credit and they need to be able to earn interest. Those are what right. I consider to be kind of the core pillars. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the base layer protocol solves the first one of being able to send and receive and, uh, and hold money. And then a money market protocol adds uh, those next two pillars of being able to uh, get credit and, uh, and earn interest. So the way that Moolah works is that a liquidity provider can deposit, say, cello dollars, and uh, that, that's it. They can just sit on that and it's say it's going to earn interest. It's going to earn yield. It's going to accumulate compound interest. That interest how do you is determine how much the interest is going to be and how it gets paid. So currently it's a variable interest rate and it's a function of the utilization of the, of the liquidity pool. So yeah. what that means is that uh, the more, yeah. you know, let's say that there's a uh, hundred dollars in the liquidity pool. Uh, if one dollar is being borrowed, then the interest rate that's being paid by the borrower and earned by the liquidity provider is quite low. Uh, but if uh, somebody comes in and borrows ninety percent, ninety dollars of the hundred dollars, then the uh, interest rate is going to get much higher. And so what that does is essentially incentivize an equilibrium when the when the utilization gets too high, as defined by the protocol then the interest rate gets very high and it becomes very expensive to borrow. So that incentivizes borrowers to pay back their outstanding loans or liquidity providers to deposit more capital. So that's how it kind of uh, self balances into always having some liquidity available for people who want to uh, want to withdraw their funds. Yeah, what, what questions can I answer about, about that? I know there's a lot there. I know there's a lot there. I'm like, how do we start? I mean, okay, the idea that someone's going to put in money and it really has to do with how many people are there borrowing. That's what's going to supply and demand wise, just drive up the prices. And so there's got to be an equilibrium. That makes sense. Um, I think what's getting, what a lot of people that are newer to uh, crypto kind of get stuck on is like, you know, it, it's kind of like with crypto, it's, it's like you took a city and you just took out all the stoplights and you're like, we can drive. It's fine. The algorithm will figure it out. And you're like, no, no, actually we, but who's in charge and what happens when there's a crash and who do we call? You know, it's like, no, we can't, we, we work it out, but how do you work it out? We have, we have algorithms in these protocols and it's like, wait, 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 wait. You know, I would love to have, it's, it's almost a, um, not quite yet self-driving car city with no stoplights. <laughs> so, so like, I mean, there's a difference between not having uh, government and not having governance. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no government in these systems, but there is a system of governance. Uh, there's a system of, of rulemaking. And the difference is that uh, here the rules are public and everybody knows what they are. And there are there are so-called hard promises where mm -hmm. you know that you are going to uh, be able to expect certain behavior. And if you do certain things, there will be certain outcomes or if you don't do certain things, there won't be certain outcomes. And so this is how these systems, uh, this is how these systems are able to organize. Again, it's a it's an organizational tool, right? It it helps yeah. uh, people to organize. Now, Cello built in a governance mechanism at the base layer. That was the other uh, pillar that I, I alluded to earlier, but didn't uh, didn't quite speak fast enough to get to. Uh, and essentially, no rush. You, this you works take all the time you need. This is fantastic. No, really, no rush. It's fine. <laughs> So there's a native asset and there's a finite quantity of the native asset. There's a, a billion units that'll ever be in existence. And uh, anybody who owns the native asset can vote on governance proposals or can propose governance proposals. And that uh, is the Celo dollar? That's uh, the Celo native asset. Sorry, and Celo native asset. Is, yeah, so there's two assets currently on Celo, Celo dollars what? and the Celo native asset. And what's the Celo native assets ticker? 
CELO, C-E-L-O. And what is the CELO dollars ticker? C-U-S-D. C-U-S-D. Okay, so you guys, if you're going to look out for what for, for what you're looking for, if you want to use something as a utility, it's a great way to transfer money, you can go with C-U-S-D. And yeah. you can hold that all you want, but really, if you hold CELO, C-E-L-O, you're going to have the opportunity to participate as a voter, right? Yeah, and as a, as a caveat to that, uh, CELO native asset is listed on Coinbase currently as C-Gold. Uh, it was initially called C-Gold, but we had a, a, a community governance proposal to change the name from Cello Gold to just Cello. Uh, and the reason why is because it's not tied to gold and the, the analogy right. doesn't really hold and we felt like it would be confusing. Um, unfortunately, Coinbase launched the, uh, the, the trading pair without uh, looking at, uh, without taking that into consideration. And so they have the wrong ticker and uh, Coinbase has not fixed that issue, which uh, I think is quite embarrassing for them, but I'm sure they'll get to that eventually. Well, the uh, more so, publicly we can shame them, the better. The better. Maybe we should <laughs> repeat that uh, that story. Look, you know, they're they're <laughs> an investor in Cello, so they should really be on this sort of thing. But look, I'm I'm gonna you stop think, there because yeah. uh, they're they do provide they they do provide the trading pairs, and uh, you know, and they have been a, a good partner to the ecosystem in that regard. I just would like to see them uh, fix this one small. Come thing, on, guys, uh, get on it. It's important. Did you uh, hear that? <laughs> Did you hear that, Coinbase? Did you hear that? <laughs> So, um, so how has the cello, um, cello, not Siegel, but cello coin done? Is it, has the, um, the value been following this Bitcoin kind of, Bitcoin's been kind of insane lately and it's finally now cooling off, but has it been yeah. following that or has it gone its yeah, own so, way? Um, Bitcoin over the, the recent past has outperformed cello. And, uh, you know, I, what I would say is that it's, uh, it's still, it's still very early in the life cycle of this ecosystem. Uh, we just yeah. launched the mainnet in April, and uh, oh. and turned on all the functionality. You know, maybe maybe through June. So we would we would light up different contracts and make sure things were going. So it's uh, it's it's quite young, and uh, you know, product market fit is still uh, I would say has not has not been achieved yet. It's uh, it's certainly you know, on the, on the horizon. And, uh, and it's quite apparent where it's going to come from. Uh, but uh, the majority of the outcome has not been emerging markets. Um, you know, it's, it's not really a U.S. based anything. It's more of an emerging markets based. Well, no, no. I mean, look, it, uh, it is a global, it is, a, there is value to be had at a global capacity. Uh, it just, you know, who is the issue most pressing for? If you are starving because the currency that you're holding uh, is depreciating in value at you know a million percent per year, then it, you need to find another solution and you need it to survive. So people yeah. who are uh, who are who are suffering because of financial mismanagement, uh, I anticipate that uh, uh, they will be the early adopters because it is the most pressing need. Now, stepping back from that, uh, if you look at kind of like a macro scale, look at how much debt is out there sovereign debt is out there that's earning you know that, that has negative negative interest yeah uh, you know so compare that to a, a being able to come into one of these ecosystems one of these money market protocols and earn you know three four five six seven eight percent apy uh with you know a, arguably a, an, an equivalent risk profile so i think that once uh once the the larger global investor base uh, turns on to this and becomes aware of just the new tools that exist that didn't exist before and these new ways to generate yield on capital in a very low risk way. Yeah. I think that we'll see a, a trickle and then uh, and then a flood. So um, that's my thesis. That's a great thesis. I'm 100% behind that thesis. I agree. I agree with that. That's also why I'm like, you know what? Art is great. Did it for 20 years. Wonderful thing. Got to say, it's like being an astro astronaut. You're like, What's new? What I have? What I? What have I not seen yet? I got to go make it. And I, you know, to give that up, it took a lot. It took something as cool as blockchain for me to go. I think I'm gonna have to go up art and start doing something even more innovative because that's really what it is. You know, it's actually more innovative than uh, trying to imagine a new world. It's truly building something that we've really never seen before. It's really cool. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of which, what did you study in school? How did you get into this? Were you like always a finance guy or were you maybe always a coder? Were you also an artist? Were you like a skateboard kid? I'm trying to get a sense of who you were. 
Uh, I did play a lot of sports growing up. Uh, yeah, every every sport you can imagine. But uh, I studied business. I got a degree in business. I went to Wake Forest University for my undergrad, and uh, you know, and was very uh, very much entrepreneurially minded even there. Um, and uh, spent the first uh, first portion of my career in uh, sales and uh, in business development roles. And, you know, I've always had an eye for uh, appreciating complexity and complex systems, um, you know, something that stimulates my mind. Uh, but at the same time, you know, having a, having a business background, uh, I'm also very interested in uh, systems of money and, uh, and you know, in, in finance in general, being uh, also spending some time in the bank. So, uh, but I, I live in San Francisco and technology and innovation and startups are everywhere. And so, you know, this is uh, this is the ultimate recipe uh, of all of those. It's the uh, the hurricane combination of technology and finance and innovation, and uh, you know, yeah. just putting it all together to change the world and bring billions of people into the financial ecosystem. That's what that's what's happening. That sounds fantastic. That is really cool. You know, when you were when you were getting out of business school and trying to figure out which way to go and going into banking and thinking about bigger things than that and always having your eye on doing your own thing, when do you think is the biggest point in which, like in that journey, when do you think is the most um, telling point of when you kind of went, you zigged when everybody else was sort of zagging? Like, when did you go a, a definitively different route and you knew it? And it, there was more risky maybe, but it was like you had to go and cut, cut away from the crowd. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I left banking because I was looking for something that I felt was more purpose driven. And, uh, and like I said, went into the solar energy industry. And, uh, and, and I would say that I did find quite a bit of purpose in the work that I was doing there. I felt like it was making a difference and felt like, uh, you know, there was there was real change happening, but uh, it just doesn't, wasn't happening at the pace that I wanted. <laughs> And uh, and I and I felt like it was it was going to be a slow moving industry for a number of decades, but the momentum was certainly picking up, and uh, you know, and so I, I just kind of kept looking to see what else was out there where I felt like I could find a sense of purpose and to make a positive impact, and uh, you know, and, and really do something of of significance, and uh, you know, and so this uh, this checked all of those boxes uh, when I when I found it. Um, yeah, that's as that's as detailed as I can I can say. It was uh it this was is, this is your zag. Of, yeah, my zag. I mean it and it certainly did have to do with uh you know being dis uh uh not uh, not enjoying my time at the bank and feeling like uh feeling like there could there could be there's a better way to do this. Um yeah. you know, yeah, and uh you know, so don't sit around and complain about it. Uh you know, make make something happen. Uh, yeah, it's uh, absolutely. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's how I got here. Um, you said you've had a lot of projects this year. I know you did Moolah, um, and you 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 know very involved with. I think it was it was it Cello Camp or Cello Day Camp. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, Cello Camp. Yeah, it's an accelerator that uh, just uh, works with. Uh, actually, originally they. Uh, the people behind it, they they did one with uh, Libra uh, early on and uh, realized that Cello was, uh, had a lot more potential behind it. And so they pivoted over and have since done two batches. And it's really just a, a great, a, a really great experience. Um, you know, there's like weekly meetings that uh, where half of the, half of the meetings are uh, helping you to run a startup and build a product and you know, meet the right people. And then the other half is, uh, you know, it's really about self-care and becoming a, a better individual and a better human being. Uh, but, you know, what wow. I can say is that the the connections that I made so within the community uh, and being able to integrate the project that I'm working on uh, are invaluable. And, uh, you know, the the connections just uh, with other, other humans who I, you know, like and uh, want to spend more time with are, are even more valuable. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, we just had the demo day. If you want to watch the uh, the demos, there it's live on uh, on Crowdcast. Fantastic. And so for you, because you have these two, from what I can understand, some really major projects that you've built so far. What is your revenue model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the fund is a traditional two hundred and twenty um, uh, mm -hmm. structure, and uh, and the fund generates revenue by uh, uh, 
participating in the consensus mechanism. So there's, uh, there is uh, both staking yield, uh, that is when we lock up cello and vote for a validator group that is participating in the consensus, uh, you get uh, between like five to 6% APY on the, on the cello. Uh, validator nodes are also compensated. So on Bitcoin, for example, uh, the, the uh, miners are compensated with new Bitcoin. Uh, in this case, the validators uh, who are securing the network are compensated in cello dollars, which makes it easier to uh, operationalize and, uh, and forecast expenses and these sorts of things. Uh, there's, uh, and then of course, there's also the, the trading aspect of, uh, of maintaining the price peg, which requires doing a triangular arbitrage trade between the underlying, in this case, dollars, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, stable coin, cello dollars, and then the cello native assets uh, and that, uh, that triangular arbitrage trade is uh, intended to be profitable to give people an incentive. I mean, ultimately crypto economic, crypto economic systems are built to uh, create an incentive structure to incentivize specific behavior. And the behavior right. is intended to secure the system. Uh, and if they're structured properly, then it's profitable for people to do things that are in the best interest of the, of the network. Uh, so we're simply, uh, jumping in the river and uh, in, in swimming with the, the flow of the water where it's, uh, where it's you know, the, what, what it's intended to be doing, uh, which, you know, which also drives returns. Uh, the protocol, Moolah, uh, their, their fees, there's an origination fee, which is a few basis points, uh, as well as a spread that the, uh, that the reserve takes, uh, that, the, that the protocol takes which uh, comes from borrowers who are paying uh, the, the APR uh, it, and takes a little bit of that and, uh, and deposits it into a reserve account. Um, ultimately, that's gonna become a financial backstop in the event of uh, uh, essentially an insurance fund. Uh, it'll also be used to compensate governance token holders to participate in the, in the governance process of the, of the MULA protocol. Got it. Yeah. And so you said the fund was the first thing. It's just a two and 20. How big is the fund now? Right at about a million dollars. Okay. And I know, oh, full disclosure, I met you through Wield & Co, where I'm also a registered agent and a managing director. And I met you through the emergence team, where I realized you are also raising yeah, they're money. Great. So, they're great. Yeah. They're fantastic. Yeah. I was like, I want more innovators for the podcast. They're like, oh, we have them. Oh, oh here's, talk to Patrick right now. So yeah. it's been really great. You know, what I'll, what I'll say about the emergence team is that, uh, you know, they, uh, like what, what I'm doing is, uh, what I'll say is it's quite, um, you know, it's quite on the fringe of innovation. And, uh, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers that you have to understand in order to get where uh, the value is coming from and what the big picture opportunity is. Uh, but uh, but those uh, those folks, you know, after speaking to them for an hour or two, uh, asked all the right questions, uh, understood exactly, you know, what I'm doing and uh, yeah. and what the bigger opportunity is, and uh, you know, so I was I was quite impressed with uh, with their with their level of understanding of uh, of this because you know honestly you don't always get that from uh, traditional finance folks, right? Uh, yeah. There's you gotta. You got to let some of the legacy thinking go in order to uh, in order to see the future. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, you have to translate it so heavily into metaphor that they can understand that you almost lose it, and you're like, and it's just innovative, okay? It's just it's just outside of what you know. It's just see the horizon line. It's just past that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's been great. It's been great working with the emergence team. That's cool. How long have you been working with the emergence team? Uh, it's been a few months at this point. Uh, I don't remember exactly when nice. we started working together. Yeah, but uh, maybe maybe four months. And Five what's months. the number one thing that a listener can do to um, to just make the most of this podcast? Can they where can they go and download yeah. or see or touch and feel and figure out what you guys are doing? Yeah, I would say the the call to action is uh, if you're interested in the things I've said today is to download the uh, the Valora wallet. So that's V A L O R A. That's the that's the um, native cello wallet that you can text money to any other phone number in the world. And uh, yeah, so that would be that would be it. Would be to download the Valora wallet and uh, you know start sending money to people around the world and uh, amaze them. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Actually, I have some ideas right away of who I want to text some money to. So 
That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, do you have anything else that you'd like to cover? You've been so busy this year. I mean, I feel like in some ways the year has been three days long and in other ways it's been 3000 days long. But uh, you know, not all of us have been as prolific in this weird time warp as you have been. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I guess what I would uh, what I would leave us with is that uh, you know, if if what I'm talking about resonates with you, and if you believe that we can build a better financial system, and that you know we can unbank all of us and provide financial access to billions of people who don't have it, uh, come join our community. Uh, it's a it's an open community. There are plenty of roles that need to be filled. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and we need all sorts of skill sets. You don't have to be a computer scientist. Uh, you know, there's, we, need, we need more people who are outside of that particular uh, skill set. So uh, join, the, join the Cello community and uh, you know, come, come change the world with us. Ha, that is a great place to stop. I love it. Come change the world with us. Oh, well, this has been such an enormous pleasure. I, I love getting to know what you guys are doing who you're affecting, the lives that are changing for this and for the better, the impact-driven focus that you've got. It's just been an absolute pleasure to talk with you today, Patrick. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, yeah, My and this pleasure. is this is great. Any uh, any final words other than let's go change the world together? <laughs> no, that's where we're gonna end it. Thanks a lot, Monica. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Patrick. Um, we'll catch you next time on the New Trust Economy. I'm signing off now. This is Monica Profit and Patrick Barron. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at New Trust Economy. Thanks for exploring the New Trust Economy with us. <laughs>